In today's sermon, we're going to be thinking about the resurrection of Jesus, big surprise, but we're also going to be reading about the resurrection of a man named Lazarus. And so I'm going to read from John 11 about Lazarus, and I'm going to read it in a few sections with a little comment after each section. Um, but before I read the first section of today's text, um, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, you loved the world so much that you sent your only Son to the cross. And the cross is a symbol of torture and pain and death. Things that do not seem compatible with the word love. But on the cross, we see the true nature of love. Jesus himself said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And so, Father, thank you that although you allowed your son to die, you did not leave him in the grave. His resurrection proves that we also can have new life. And Holy Spirit, would you help us see your word tonight with new eyes, that we can receive truth with open hearts. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so our first section here from John 11, 1 to 6. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick, and he was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. And this Mary whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, she's the same Mary who once poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And so the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So we learn in these verses a few things. One, Jesus was very close to this family. Uh, Mary of these family is not Mary Magdalene. She's actually one of six women named Mary in the New Testament. This is the Mary you may have read about when she sat at the feet of Jesus while Martha was busy in the kitchen. This is the Mary who poured expensive perfume on Jesus to prepare him for his execution. And Mary and Martha have a brother named Lazarus, and he's really sick. And they know that Jesus can heal the sick, so they send a message to him. <clears throat> but as you just heard, Jesus waits to go. And he waits on purpose. Verse 6 says, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. <clears throat> Why did Jesus wait? Another question for you. Has God ever made you wait after you pray? Yes. Has he made you wait after you pray? What I want you to know, friends, is that your Father in Heaven never ignores the prayers of his children. He will never ignore them. Sometimes he responds by saying yes. Other times, because he loves us, he says no, or he says wait. But your Father in heaven will always listen to his children and respond with wisdom. This is promised to us in Psalm 18. David, who wrote this, he's afraid because there's people trying to kill him. And he says, in my distress, I call to the Lord. I cried to my God for help, and from his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. So friend, when you pray, your cries go straight 
into the ears of your heavenly Father. Mary and Martha cried out to Jesus for help, and he heard their cries. So he didn't wait because he's uncaring. Jesus explained in verse 4 why he waited. He said in verse 4, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So we'll see in a few minutes what Jesus meant by those words. But I want to continue reading from John 11. Verse 14. So then he told his disciples plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let's go also, that we may die with him. And on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. I don't know if you're wondering this, but I wondered when I read this, why does John, the author, mention geography in verse 18? What does that have to do with anything? Why? Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. Why is that there? The answer is in verse 16b, the top of the screen. Thomas said, let us go with him, with Jesus, so that we may die with him. You see, the disciples knew that there were a lot of people in Jerusalem who did not like Jesus. There were religious authorities who did not understand his teaching about the kingdom of God. They were threatened by his popularity. And the, the religious authorities were very upset that he claimed to be the son of God. I want you to hear what happened the last time Jesus was in Jerusalem. The last time before this, Jesus was in Jerusalem. This is what happened in John 10. Jesus said this, I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So, this is the point about geography. When Jesus went to Bethany, two miles from Jerusalem, he was returning to the place where this threat was made. Jesus was walking to his death. And the disciples knew this. Jesus knew this. But Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. His delays, his words, his timing, they're all according to the Father's plan. In verses 14 to 15, Jesus told the disciples why he waited. He told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, which sounds strange, but it's so that you may believe. So, when Jesus and the disciples arrive in Bethany, Lazarus is not just dead, he's really, really dead. What does that mean? See, at the time, the Jewish people believed that when you died, your soul came out and it kind of lingered around your body for a few days. It just kind of hung around in the neighborhood near your body. But after a few days, the soul departed. And once your soul's gone, your body is beyond all hope of resuscitation. Therefore, Jesus waited to make it clear that Lazarus was really, really dead. 
And this, by the way, is the same reason why Jesus was in the tomb for three days. You see, because Lazarus and Jesus were both dead and buried for days, the skeptics could not argue that they were only partially dead. And there's one more reason why Jesus waited. All right? In verse 19, it said, Many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them. See, the delay of Jesus meant that many people have gathered by the time Jesus arrives. They're there to comfort the sisters, but the crowd is also there by God's design. They're there to hear Jesus speak, to see his glory revealed, and to believe in him. So look at what happened when Jesus arrived. Verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who is to come into the world. So Martha is the first one to talk to Jesus when he arrives. Mary seems disappointed by Jesus' delay. I think maybe that's why she doesn't come out with Martha. But Martha wants to know why Jesus waited. And it's an honest question. In his answer, Jesus begins to shift Martha's eyes away from grief to hope. He wants to draw her attention away from her dead brother and toward her living Savior. And I want you to notice something. When, when Jesus speaks to Martha, he doesn't say, don't cry, Martha, because I can do resurrections. I got resurrection power, so don't cry. I'm, I'm going to do something here. He doesn't say, I can do resurrections. What does he say? I am the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in me will live. And even though they die, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe it? Jesus asked Martha, do you believe this, before she saw the miracle? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. You see, some people won't believe in Jesus because they're waiting for sufficient evidence. Some people say, I will believe it when I see it. But Jesus invited Martha to believe in him as Lord and Savior before she saw Lazarus alive. What I want you to hear is that we cannot demand that God give us visible signs before we will believe. We need to believe his word. Because the word of God is true, and why is it true? Because God is truth. And the question that Jesus asks Mary, this question echoes through eternity, friends. He asks, do you believe this? And I ask you, do you? Do you know that through faith in Jesus Christ, anyone, can experience new life that is eternal life 
That's the question of Easter. If you want real life, eternal life, Jesus is the only one who can give it to you. And many of you have received that gift through faith in Christ. <laughs> but I ask all of you, do you believe it? Or is your heart still asleep today? If your heart's still asleep, I just have one question. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What prevents you from trusting in Jesus today as your Lord and Savior? What's standing in the way? Do you really want to wait any longer? Why would you delay in receiving the gift of eternal life that Jesus offers? Why would you wait? I'm just going to pause and ask everybody to pray. Pray for yourself. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for someone you love. Do you believe this? Jesus, thank you for the free gift of eternal life. And I pray that no one who has heard the gospel will fail to respond to the free grace you offer through Jesus Christ. Amen. So friends, there's just one more lesson that Jesus wants to teach us before he resurrects Lazarus. Listen to verses 32 to 37. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw Mary weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? I want to focus on those two words, Jesus wept. That means he cried a lot. And for 2,000 years, people have been trying to understand these tears of Jesus. You see, Jesus knows that Lazarus is going to be alive in a few minutes. So he's probably not crying for Lazarus. Some believe that Jesus was crying because Mary and the crowd did not have faith. And I think there's several additional reasons for his tears. These are, this is my list. Jesus cried because of our unbelief. He cried because of our grief. He cried because of sin and death. And he cried for his own death. And I'm just going to unpack those reasons for his tears briefly. Psalm 34, 18 tells us this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. So one reason Jesus weeps is he was there for his brokenhearted friends. His physical presence comforted them. And we do the same thing for our friends and family when someone dies. Whenever Jesus saw hurting people, the Bible says he was moved with compassion. Jesus feels our feelings. In Psalm 56, 8, David prays to God, You keep track of all my sorrows. You've collected my tears in your bottle. You've recorded each tear, each one in your book. 
Friends, when Jesus returns one day, death will die. And he will wipe every tear from our eyes. But until that day, our Lord weeps with us. And so when Jesus was standing by the grave of Lazarus, Jesus wept with everyone who has ever lost a loved one to death. And as Jesus wept, his guts were twisted with sadness, but also with anger about this destructive power of death. And so another reason that Jesus wept is he could see the cause of all our human pain, which is sin. He wept for the sin that causes death, and Jesus wept because he knew his death was the only cure for sin. That to free us, to, to get rid of sin and death for all time, Jesus had to be covered in our sin, and he had to die our death. And in his human heart, he didn't want to go to the cross. He was weeping and sweating blood the night before he died. The word troubled that we heard in verse 33, it's the exact same Greek word we find in John 12. That when Jesus was overwhelmed with fear about crucifixion, he wept. And he prayed to God, now my soul is deeply troubled. But should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? This is the very reason I came. So, Father, bring glory to your name. When Jesus was crying, he asked the Father, if there is any way you can get me out of this, get me out of this. I don't want to do this. Jesus wanted an escape plan from the cross, and the Father said, no. Why would he reject the prayer of his beloved son, Jesus? Because the death of Jesus was the only way life is possible for you and me. The only reason God can say yes to our prayers tonight is because he said no to Jesus' prayer. Jesus had to die so we could receive life. That's the definition of God's love. And when the people saw the tears pouring out of Jesus, they said, see how he loved him. Friends, when you see the tears of Jesus, I want you to think, see how he loved me. See how he loved me. Can you see the tears? Can you see the tears and the blood that poured out of Jesus for you? Can you see them? Look at the cross. Look at the empty tomb. And then rejoice, because the cross and the empty tomb prove how much Jesus loves you. Now let's read the final part of John 11, starting in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He has been there four days. Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped 
in strips of linen. There was a cloth over his face. And Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes and let him go. So friends, Jesus let Lazarus lay dead in the tomb so that there would be a crowd gathered to watch. Do you think Jesus was just an egotistical man who was desperate for a lot of attention? No. In everything Jesus did, he was seeking the glory of God. And so before commanding Lazarus to come out, Jesus spoke to the Father. He's drawing attention toward God, away from Lazarus. You see, the resurrection is a miracle, but in John's gospel, the miracles are always called signs. Because it was through these powerful acts that the true identity and divinity of Jesus was revealed. Lazarus thought he knew his friend Jesus before today. But when Lazarus walked out of the tomb, a whole new life began. And I have to think that because Lazarus had tasted death, he understood the precious gift of new life. The gift of new life. So do you and I understand the gift we have received? Do we really understand the gift of new life? And that's the last point I want to make tonight. I want you to notice this powerful thing Jesus says in the last verse. Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes and let him go. So brothers and sisters, are you still wearing your grave clothes? Are you still carrying burdens of sin and shame? Are you still carrying those stains that Jesus died to remove? Friends, our sin and shame were buried with Christ. We carry them no longer. Satan wants to keep you wrapped up in guilt, regret, addiction, anger, bitterness. Whatever it is, Satan wants you to believe you are not forgiven and that you are wrapped and trapped in your old ways. But listen to the commanding words of Jesus again. He says, let him go. Let her go. And so take off your grave clothes, friends. Walk in new life as the children of God. So we've seen tonight, friends, that Jesus wept for many reasons. He was willing to face painful death so we will never cry again. That's our hope. That's our future. And so thinking of the future, I want to do a closing prayer together from the book of Revelation. Revelation is a book that was written by the same Apostle John who just told us about Lazarus. And I'm going to invite you to stand with me. And let's read what John saw in his vision from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Together. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, 
For the old order of things has passed away. Amen. Amen.